Okay, let's see. Um, if this is Wednesday, this must be Albuquerque. <laughs> because last night we were in... Um, Las Cruces, uh, with the mayor of Las Cruces and his father. And you know, the mayor is half Japanese. His mom is Mexican and his dad is uh, Japanese American. <coughs> And he, the dad, was in, in a camp like us. And then the mayor's grandfather was a prisoner in Lordsburg. Lordsburg, that's where they canceled us. Oh yeah, because of the protest. But the mayor said, we will not stand down. If the high school doesn't want to host them, they can do it in the mayor's chambers. I was really excited about that. What's the mayor's name? Kent Clark, Clark <laughs> Smith, like Clark Kent, like Superman. But they finally kept it at the school and everybody showed up. The gymnasium was full. Over 200 people. I got to show my brother's Purple Hearts. And... Two of them. And they gave us the key to the city. Plus these little um, stickers, there's the, this is New Mexico, of course, and then the Roadrunner, and it says Lordsburg. So we are honorary citizens of Lordsburg. So that woman actually did us a favor. She did make a speech after our presentation, but then like eight or 10 people lined up after her and went up to the mic in support of us. And, um, you know, people said they were Mexican and they were Native American, and uh, so there was a lot of identity there. So it was a really wonderful experience. Okay, so that was uh, Lordsburg Monday afternoon, and then we did Silver City in the evening, and New Mexico State last night. And, okay, so it, yeah, it's Wednesday and it's Albuquerque, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Nikki Nojima Lewis and I'm the Humanities Scholar and Program Designer for tonight's presentation. And I'm uh, Herb Tuchia, a retired pharmacist from Seattle, uh, Washington, father of five, grandfather of 12, and great-grandfather great of one. So we are part of a continuing series of projects on the Japanese American experience sponsored by the New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League or JSEL. And we are grateful to the New Mexico Humanities Council for making these appearances possible. We're doing seven venues in six days. This is number five. Is that humane? Well, it's not the Humane Society, Herb. It's Humanities. Still. Uh, and because some members of our audience um, are attending more than one event, we're, we vary our programming so it's not repetitive. And it, especially our panel presentations. Tomorrow, when we're in Gallup, we'll be with Medal of Honor winner Hershey Miyamura. Can I show my brother's pur two purple hearts? Of I already course, did that. Of I course. gave you an early preview. <laughs> hey. Two, two more times. But, but let's do the Hibben Auditorium tonight. Uh, so to let you know the general d direction and timing of today's program, our project director, Sam Mihara, will narrate slides of Heart Mountain, one of the so-called family camps that were operated by the War Relocation Authority. Then, Nikki and I will bring you another kind of camp story, the prison camps of New Mexico, related to you through diary entries kept by the prisoners at Lordsburg Camp. So these two presentations will conclude with a panel discussion, and that will be about the first hour. Um, first, we'll have JCL board member Victor Yamada on our current projects, and he's the coordinator of special projects for JCL. And then we'll have Dr. Andy Russell on the prison camps of New Mexico, after which we'll have a Q&A and you can talk. 
So I want to tell you that three of the people here tonight, at least three of them, um, are among the last generation to have experienced removal from their homes on the West Coast and incarceration by their own government behind barbed wire and under gun towers in isolated parts of the United States. Sam Mihara in Heart Mountain, Wyoming, and Herb and I in Minidoka, Idaho. Nikki and I are from Seattle, way up there in rain country. On December 7, 1941, a place called Pearl Harbor was attacked. And the next day, it was suddenly World War II. When the news came over the radio, my mother said, what is Parahaba? December 7, 1941 was Nikki's fourth birthday. On that day, the FBI entered her home in Seattle and removed her father, as well as hundreds of other Issei in Hawaii and on the mainland. Issei means first generation. With a Japanese numbering system, Ichi is one, Ni is two, and second generation is Nisei. Herb and I are Nisei. After interrogation at an army fort, when after my father was taken away, he was held in Lordsburg and then Santa Fe prison camps from 1942 to 1946. So Herb, how old were you when you went to Minidoka? I was uh, 10 years old. Do you remember anything about it? I was just four. I remember my address, uh, Block 13, Barrack 6, Apartment C. Wow. Starting in April 1942, we were taken to temporary sites such as racetracks, stockyards, fairgrounds. We lived in horse stalls and underneath the grandstand at the Washington State Fairgrounds. New barracks were built with wood so green that it shrunk when the rains came, uh, leaving such wide gaps that scorpions, snakes, and all kinds of critters crawled in between the boards. Do you remember what our temporary camp was called? It was called Camp Harmony. <laughs> but by November 1942, the move to 10 permanent WRA camps was complete. Manzanar, California. Granada, Colorado. Poston, Arizona. Gila River, Arizona. Topaz, Utah. Rohrer, Arkansas. Jerome, Arkansas. Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Minidoka, Idaho. Idaho. Our first presentation centers on Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where our principal speaker, Sam Mihara, spent a part of his childhood. Sam is a retired rocket scientist who now resides in Huntington Beach, California, and travels all over the country with his talks on the Japanese American experience. Sam Mihara. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the fanciest introduction I've ever had, and I've been uh, doing a fair amount of uh, speaking, so I get a lot of introduction. Before I begin, I want to show you a couple of things. One is uh, I have a gift for every one of you. On the table, there is a new DVD that I just produced, and it has a more complete version of the summary I'm going to give you tonight. So if you're interested, uh, please pick one up. I I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. The other, I didn't have enough sheets, but I try to get out as many as I can, a feedback sheet. This is extremely important, and if you can fill it out uh, at the uh, end of the presentation, it, it really helps out. And we keep, we, we read ours from last night, and we made a few changes, and so we're constantly in the mode of, uh, of the uh, improvements. Uh, can we have the lights down, or, or do I do it up here? No, let's see. Well, we can do that for a while. That's fine. That's fine. We can, we can go that way. Okay, this is a story about uh, uh, the overall camp experience and uh, in particular details of what happened to me and my family and my friends at, uh, at Heart Mountain. Uh, to go back, uh, I need to go back to Japan because that's where our family began. The Mihara clan began in a small uh, city, it's a big town uh, called Matsuyama City in uh, Western Japan, about 400 miles west of uh, Japan, uh, of Tokyo. And uh, 
They're famous for a castle, one of 12 original castles that remain uh, in Japan. And there are more castles, but they're not original. And, and you can tell, and sometimes you can tell an original castle because uh, some of them, uh, to get to the castle top, you have to ride an elevator. And there was no electricity in the 16th century when they were built. Uh, but this is an original. You have to, uh, they have a series of step ladders, by the way, to go level to level. So uh, when the emergency uh, uh, alert is sounded, all of the uh, town people, including the leaders uh, of the clan, would run up to the, the top of the castle. The last person behind pulls up the step ladder as you go from le level to level. Uh, so that's a defense mechanism to re you know, hold down the, the advancing uh, enemy from coming to the top of the castle. So, so the, uh, the highest level of the clan gets at the very top of the castle, and then you have uh, different grades of, of, uh, of people, uh, including my, my uh, grandpa, grandpa and grandma. They were, uh, they were not really in that level of a class, and so they were working people. They, uh, grandpa made uh, miso uh, paste. Uh, anybody had miso or miso soup? A few of you. Ah, oh, you've been to a Japanese restaurant. You probably had a miso soup. <laughs> Okay, so instead of chicken base and instead of a tomato base, uh, a miso is used, and it's a soybean paste. And Grandpa used to make this soybean paste in this factory. That wasn't enough income. So Grandma had to go to work, and she worked at a, uh, a uh, textile weaving company. And they're famous for a blue and white textile in Matsuyama. And, and I went to see the machine, the original uh, textile machine that she operated. It was in a museum in Matsuyama. And I looked at the floor, and it's operated by foot. Again, no electricity. So she was operating this foot-operated machine for eight hours a day, pumping away. But that's the kind of life they were in. And they were locked in in that, in that economic cycle. And they figured out, and I give credit to Grandpa and Grandma, they figured out they had to at least get their son, my father, a good education. And with that education, they felt that he would be the leader to come into the US with that talent. Well, of all things, he majored in English. <laughs> he went to the best college in Japan called Waseda University, and he majored in English. So now he was really skilled in Japanese and, and, and skilled in, in English, and uh, he, he quickly got a job in, in the US, in San Francisco. There's a bilingual newspaper and he became the editor. And then when he came over, then the rest of the family came over. So that's our, that's our uh, brief history as to uh, how we immigrated uh, into the US. This is a map of uh, the uh, people uh, of Japanese ancestry who settled in uh, California. And California held about 80% of the Japanese who came into the US. The dark areas, uh, like in San Francisco area, and uh, urban areas in so, uh, Los Angeles and San Diego. A lot of the urban uh, skilled people came there. Uh, but there was a large number of people who were uh, farmers. Uh, they developed their skills in Japan and they brought that skill with them, uh, with them to uh, the US. And those are people who are in, in areas like in Sacramento uh, and farms around the Central Valley called uh, Fresno and even way down south here in Imperial County. Uh, California, uh, where a lot of citrus, uh, winter citrus fruits are, are grown. And so that was the nature of how we, uh, the Japanese settled uh, into uh, uh, California. Let me introduce you, introduce you to my family. Uh, that brat right there, that's me. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, eight years old in uh, 1940. And for some reason, every photograph of the family at that age, I got this strange, resistant kid smile. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so anyway, this is the best I can do for this photograph. Uh, that's my brother next to me, and my father, and my mother, Grandpa Mihara, Grandma Mihara. The elder Miharas are born in Japan, and therefore, they're first generation Japanese. And we call them Issei. E comes from the number one, Ichi. And, and the people who are born in the U.S., like my brother and myself, were called Nisei. Ni is number two. Uh, and the people who would then be my kids would be Sansei, or third generation, and so forth and so forth. That's how we identify the generation of the uh, Japanese in, in the U.S. 
This is San Francisco uh, back in uh, the uh, early, late 30s, early 40s, and uh, typical uh, uh, Victorian houses of San Francisco. These are mom and pop stores, and uh, the family lived immediately above each store in these Victorian houses. And I lived on a uh, block behind this in a similar uh, house. Uh, it was on Sutter Street, and uh, the house was very similar to one of, one of these uh, multi-story Victorians. How many of you recognize this photograph? Yeah. Oh, you're really well educated. You know your photography, Dorothea Lang. Dorothea Lang. Well, I got a story to tell you about Dorothy because she was skilled at taking pe people's faces. And that picture uh, by Dorothy Lang, that's her on the right, by the way, taking a uh, photograph. Uh, she she uh, was assigned by the government to go into uh, the farm country in California. Uh, in uh, Central California, just east of uh, the area called Santa Maria, uh, California. And her assignment is to try to uh, show pictures of the people on, and the conditions that were going on during the Great Depression. This was shot in about 1933. And, um, and she got this, this one picture. She, some, somehow, she went to a farm, found this family, and uh, had a situation where the, the family had this expression, and you can read that without reading the caption, that this family's in deep trouble. So, so with that skill, the government never forgot it, and when uh, Pearl Harbor took place, they assigned her to come to San Francisco and take pictures of the Japanese now in the process of removal. The only, the only catch to her assignment is the government told her, do not take pictures that are embarrassing make the government look good. So don't take any pictures that are, are bad news. And she does not take orders on what <laughs> pictures to take. The camera is her weapon, and she figures that I'm gonna take pictures the way I see it, and she took pictures that were very embarrassing, and I'm gonna show you some of these tonight. Uh, one of these pictures is a, a group of fellows, these are my buddies in a grammar school about two blocks from Japantown. And uh, the fellow in the striped shirt here, he goes by that name, Hisashi Kobayashi. Now, Kobayashi is relatively a common name, but the first name, Hisashi, uh, our buddies who were non-Japanese had trouble understanding and, and being able to pronounce our names. The parents gave us these long, fascinating, but difficult to pronounce names. And so Hisashi was uh, hard to pronounce by the other uh, fellows, and so what we said was, okay, we're going to all adopt nicknames. And in this case, we called uh, Hisashi Kobayashi, we called him Kobe, you know, like the famous uh, Bryant. And uh, so Kobe uh, was known as this, this fellow right here. This photograph is probably the most famous of all the pictures that Dorothy Lang took of the Japanese. It was uh, eight, uh, eight year old girls in a second grade uh, school, uh, second grade grammar school, uh, two blocks from Japantown. And uh, the girls are in their morning ritual reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, like all people do, uh, young, young people do in the mornings. And that included that phrase, with liberty and justice for all. And we were denied liberty, we were denied justice in the process of our removal uh, from uh, San Francisco. But again, what, what, what's important is Dorothea Lang had that uh, skill to, to know that moment when these girls are giving that expression. They're, they're indicating their loyalty by, by sincerely reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. You can't get eight-year-old girls, actors, to re reproduce this uh, situation, but she had the skill to catch that moment, and this picture turned out to be quite famous. I'll talk about, about that a little bit more. At the start of World War II, the media went crazy. These are kinds of cartoons and ads that were going around the country, mostly uh, in the newspapers, but also in, in road signs, and, and uh, uh, implying that the people of Japanese ancestry in this country are, are disloyal, and uh, their potential uh, conduct uh, potential uh, espionage to their spies and, and uh, not to be trusted in, in that environment was, was creating this hysteria among the people by reading the newspaper. So they did a terrible service to us uh, at that time. 
Here's a headline from the San Francisco Examiner. Uh, Ouster of the Japs are near. Well, you know, Ouster being removal, and this came out before the government made the announcement of creating these camps. So in other way, the, the timing is such that the, the newspaper, the examiner, was, was spreading the word, the image that now is the time to get these people out of here. And so that continued to boil the, uh, the imagination of the people and, and get them motivated. And those are the kinds of names uh, that we're, we were being call, called. Uh, I, when I speak and I, I talk to a lot of young, young people and their teachers, and I find that many of them do not know that the word Japs is very insulting and demeaning. And we ask, I ask them all to be sure to uh, refrain from using that in a social uh, gathering or, or in a casual conversation. To be historically accurate to show that's okay because you want to be accurate, but you don't want to repeat that. And, and, uh, and so uh, I ask, you know, I say people don't think about it as, as uh, the use of the N-word. You know, you wouldn't teach your kids to uh, liberally use the N-word and, uh, and, you, and uh, you'll never get a job if you t look for one. And, and uh, so just, just be very careful. All of this then resulted in an idea by the government. Uh, the idea was this. If uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt were to sign an executive order uh, requiring that anyone in the military districts around the United States, and there were several districts, you know, West Coast, East Coast, and so forth, any commander of those districts will be given the authority to remove anyone they want to without naming a particular race. Okay, so what it is is giving the authority to the military to remove people. He doesn't say the Japanese in this order. He simply says the authority is being delegated to the military. And he signed this order called Executive Order 9066 at that time. Following that, the military order for the West Coast, uh, General DeWitt made the um, decision and announcement that it shall be the Japanese living in California, Oregon, and Washington who are the chosen people and required that they move out relatively quickly. And, he, and this, this is an example of one of the five steps in the removal. These are parents of a family, the heads of the household lining up at a registration office in San Francisco to register the whole family. So that's the way the government got these lists of names and ages and, and relatives and friends in order to find out who should be leaving and they use that as planning for determining how many camps and where they should be located and, and the people assigned. This photograph was taken by Dorothea Lang, and it's one of the, the typical ones that she took that shows a, a picture the government did not want released because it shows the armed guard forcing people to uh, do things like removal out of their homes. And so what the government did was to take all thousand of Dorothy's pictures and impound them in a vault at UC Berkeley in the Bancroft Library and held there for about 40 years. And no one knew these pictures uh, existed until they were released. And uh, after they were released, I had some access to it and UC Berkeley gave me permission to show these you tonight. So I, I think you'll be impressed with some more of the work that she's been doing. At the time of our removal, there were three people, three Japanese Americans, Niseis, who resisted. Uh, and uh, what's hard to believe is why only three? Because the rest of the 120,000, uh, almost the rest of the 120,000, willingly went along with the government orders. But these three were very, very unique. Let me b uh, briefly mention uh, the highlights of, of what they did. Korematsu, Fred Korematsu, uh, was a, a ship welder in Oakland, California, across from San Francisco. And, and when he, uh, when Pearl Harbor took place, uh, he was, you know, fired immediately from that sensitive job. Uh, and uh, what he did was he, he, he had a girlfriend, uh, a white Italian girl, which, by the way, in those days was a no-no. <laughs> and, and so he, he, he and, and, and his girlfriend figured out what to do is uh, you're going to get plastic surgery. 
and you're going to change your face, you're going to change your name. And that picture was taken after the surgery. You know, I would ask for my money back. That was terrible. <laughs> uh, but the new employee, they had to get new, uh, new employment because he needed the money for, for moving and getting married and so forth. So what happened was uh, he was caught trying to find a job by the new employer saying, you're Japanese, I'm going to report you. He went to prison. Gordon Hirabayashi from Seattle uh, was raised as a Quaker. And the Quakers taught him about the principle of constitutionality. And he was in a university library uh, studying with the rest of his friends. And at uh, 8 o'clock, there's a curfew, 8 o'clock at night. Everybody had to go and be back in their homes, and, and uh, you're under house arrest at, at nighttime. Well, he resisted. He said, I'm going to stay till 11 o'clock, just like all my white friends around here. Uh, why should I have to do something like that? It's unconstitutional. So he stayed in the library. He got caught and went to a prison. The guy on the right, Minori Asui, very unusual. He was a lawyer. He knew what his rights were. And, and he decided he's going to um, challenge the government. And what he did was after curfew began at 11 o'clock at night, he went out in the streets of Portland, Oregon, found the policeman, and told him, I am Japanese. At 11 o'clock at night, arrest me, because I'm going to challenge you and this, this arrest in court. Uh, the policeman didn't believe him, so told him to go home. And then the, the uh, so Min, re <laughs> Min uh, being the kind of person he is, he went to a, a police station and reported to the sergeant. And the sergeant told him, you're arrested. And so he took him away. He was in solitary confinement for nine years before he went to prison. So uh, uh, all three are considered as, as uh, uh, activists who, who tried to resist. Uh, and among the three, uh, Yasui is probably the most important uh, in the way of what he did. We got on the buses in San Francisco. They came to pick us up and, and uh, take us on a bus, each of us hand carrying one bag, and went to our first camps. Uh, w these are called assembly centers. Well, what they are, they're horse racetracks. There are horse racetracks all along the West Coast, and the government closed them for the, the duration of the war, and they put barbed wire fences around each one, guard towers, armed guards, and so forth. So they made it a prison. And we were jammed in there, uh, packed with people, and, and they just kept filling it until they couldn't hold any more. And all the racetracks in, in, uh, in the West Coast uh, uh, held uh, all of us. And unfortunately, for the first group of people who went there, they had to live in horse stalls. Uh, and when they ran out of horse stalls, because so many people were coming in, then the government built some shacks right in front, very similar in construction to the horse stalls. And I remember living in one of those shacks. Uh, at, uh, at the horse track. The day came exactly three months after we got there that um, the trains came to pick us all up. And now the military was out shoulder to shoulder, make sure that we don't move. A typical, another example of an embarrassing photo to the government. But uh, we were on that train for four days and three nights and never told us where we were going. And our train went to Hart Mountain, Wyoming, a uh, very, very remote place. Let me show you where all the camps are. This is a map of all the camps in the US uh, at the time. Those dots on the left are the uh, temporary assembly centers uh, that were operated for three months. The stars in the middle of the country were existing or uh, quickly built uh, prison camps uh, for uh, certain people of the Japanese uh, uh, community, these were considered high-risk people. The FBI identified certain members of the community, like uh, uh, ministers and uh, business leaders, and all of the men, first generation, then went to these particular prisons. There were three here in New Mexico, one at Santa Fe, one in Lordsburg, and one in Fort Stanton, a smaller one. Uh, like others, there were many in Texas, so there was one up here in, in uh, Montana. And, and so that's where the, the men, the high-risk people, went, uh, were sent. The families, however, uh, were sent to the major camps. They're called uh, uh, relocation centers, but there was one in Wyoming, one in Idaho, one in Utah, one in Colorado, two way out here in Arkansas, two in southern uh, Arizona, and one, uh, two in uh, eastern slopes of uh, California. I'll talk about Tule Lake in particular in a moment. Where is Hart Mountain? Well, uh, if you've been to Yellowstone, you'll know that it's on the left corner, the uh, 
northwest corner of Wyoming over here. And uh, here's a little town of Cody, Wyoming, uh, about uh, 2,000, 3,000 people. Uh, and further up the main highway is another town called Powell, Wyoming, about 1,000 people. And uh, Heart Mountain is right in the middle between the two, about 15 miles from each of those two towns. And uh, what was interesting to me was to try to find out what did the people of Cody think when they first heard there's going to be a 10,000 Japanese coming to their neighborhood. And so I did some research. I read every Cody newspaper starting in 1940, and a lot of it was boring until this particular headline, and I'm sorry, I'll talk about the headline in a moment. But uh, there's a, another way to find out what the people thought, and there are this through interviews of people who used to live there. And one of those was a fellow named Alan Simpson, Senator Alan Simpson. Uh, he was a teenager at that time, living in Cody. And he, he did an interview, and I got a copy of his uh, taped interview when he talked about what the people of Cody thought when these massive numbers of Japanese were coming to their neighborhood. Let's watch it. So then we were told there were 11,000 people there. Well, there were only two cities larger than that in Wyoming. That was Cheyenne and Casper. Powell was about 2,500, Cody probably 3,500. And so people thought, now if those people escape, we'll all be killed. Well, there were 11,000 of them there, and they were going to break out, and they'll come to town, and we'll be dead. Isn't that ridiculous? You know, a, a massive attack of men, women, and children, and elderly is going to break out of camp, go descend on, on Cody, and, and kill them all with our bare hands. But that was a mentality uh, of the people there at Cody, and a similar one at Powell. So as a result, what the government did, uh, the head of the, all the camps, a guy named Milton Eisenhower, is a younger brother of Dwight David Eisenhower, he called a co conference, a, a, a meeting of all the governors I see on the left-hand side uh, in uh, Salt Lake City, now called the famous Salt Lake City Conference, and um, he explained the purpose of the camps, and the purpose being this is simply a gathering place. Don't worry, they're going to leave your state as soon as we can convince them to move back east. They're not going to stay in Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, and so forth. And uh, the government then tried to convince them, but the governors uh, rebelled. They said, no way are you going to allow people under unsupervised, non-guarded conditions. And they demanded that uh, the camps be made into prisons by installation of pen fences and guard towers and weapons, uh, guards with weapons. And so with one exception, by the way, Ralph Carr of Colorado he, he didn't think that was the right thing to do, so he objected. But all the other governors uh, made statements uh, on demanding that we be, be made into a, a prison. Uh, so what, what uh, Milton Eisenhower did was in, uh, he, he yielded. He said, okay, you're right. I'm going to change the design to uh, prisons. So it, it's a fact that the government, the federal government, was responsible for removing us from our homes, but it's a state government and the leaders who had converted the camps into prison camps. And that was a, uh, an important uh, historical uh, event that happened. So, why, uh, so what we're talking now about is uh, how did they build it so, so quickly? Well, they got this awful desolate country around Co uh, Heart Mountain. They brought in 2,000 workers uh, into uh, the area. They built these barracks. Uh, at a rate of one every hour around the clock until they finish the entire camp. This is a picture of almost completion of the, t of the camp. And um, in the middle area are the assembled uh, uh, barracks. In the background are the tar paper covered barracks. And, um, and that was the uh, construction activity. Here's a completed camp. There's Heart Mountain in the middle, the barracks on the left. And now the, the uh, barbed bar wire fences, the guard towers, there were nine towers surrounding the entire uh, complex uh, of the Heart Mountain camp. If I had to show one picture, and only one picture that be, will be important, that's this one here. On the left, you see a, an armed guard on top of the guard tower with a weapon pointing toward the uh, barracks. 
In the middle, it shows details of the guard tower with the searchlights aiming toward the barracks. But most important on the right side is the telltale signs. One is in English and the other is in Japanese. And it makes it clear anyone who approaches and tries to cross this fence will be shot. And that defines an, um, an imprisonment, that defines a prison. Anyone inside feels they're going to get hurt by crossing that line, you're, you're in a prison. And some people I've talked to you know, would comment, well, Har Mountain did not look like Alcatraz, so how could you call it a prison? And my point is it doesn't have to look like it, it has to feel like it. And if you feel you're going to get hurt, then you are in a prison. And so Hart Mountain and all the other camps, uh, by definition now, is a prison condition. When I got there to Hart Mountain, uh, we got off the train, uh, took our one-hand one carry bag, got on trucks, uh, and uh, notice uh, the people here getting off the train wearing what I call California clothing. Since they didn't tell us where we were going, we were wearing this very light clothing, and we, wa we got there in the fall, and uh, we had no idea of the winter that was going to uh, be experienced. Also, when I got there, um, that's me in the middle, about 11 years old, at the camp in front of my barrack. Uh, the government said, uh, you have two numbers that are very important. The first number is my uh, barrack assignment, so block 14, Barrack number 22 in uh, room or C, uh, uh, the cell number is C. Uh, and if you don't remember that, no matter what your age, if, if you don't know where you, you forgot your number, then no one else knows what, what barrack you live in. There were 500 barracks, they're all identical. So, so that's one number all, all of us remember who were in the camps, what, what, uh, what that particular location was, the block number and so forth. The second number is my prisoner number, 26737 with a letter at the end. That was designating my uh, number in the prison. And uh, to this day, uh, there is a file in the Washington, D.C. on 120,000 prisoners. All 120,000 files are in there. And anyone who is a, a relative of a, uh, of a prisoner can ask for and receive copies, a CD of all of the papers inside their, their uh, uh, relatives uh, file. That's how I got a lot of information about my my uh, parents and my grandparents. Here's a map of the camp, the location of all 30 blocks or of 500 bar uh, barracks and the railroad tracks on the side where we got off going into the main gate and, and then the trucks went over to my block which is 14 and, uh, and so. Uh, here's the details of each barrack. There were six rooms in each barrack uh, the end ones are the smallest, they held couples. Uh, the next to the end ones are the largest, the, the 24 by 20, holding uh, six or seven people. And uh, since we were a family of four, uh, we were put into a room 20 feet by 20 feet. Uh, no partitions, uh, uh, literally a, a blank room with no facilities, living there for three years. Here's the details of what the inside looks like. This is a recreation we made at the uh, museum uh, at, uh, at Hart Mountain. Uh, and uh, the rooms, uh, at the, when we got there, there were wall-to-wall -wall military cots, like you see here. In the corner, there was a pot-bellied stove uh, that burned coal. Uh, Wyoming had a lot of coal in those days, it still does, and so that was our, our fuel for the winter. Everything else you see in the picture, like furnishings, uh, any, anything that makes it more comfortable, uh, we had to buy or we had to build. Uh, and uh, so that's how we at least try to get uh, our living conditions uh, a little bit more comfortable. The toilets were an embarrassment. 16 toilets in a row serving 500 people. That's how many people there were uh, in these blocks and no partitions. That was the, probably the worst part of all, especially after breakfast. And so what we did was, uh, uh, well, we complained, but the government could not do anything about it by this time. We had to live under that condition. The Japanese love bathing. They call it ofuro, or bathing. And they love these bathtubs, uh, but there were no bathtubs, and so we made them out of pickle barrels. And uh, that way we at least had a one-person bathtub uh, in the camp. The food that we got, 
at the start was horrible. Uh, by example, this picture shows bread, potatoes, there was powdered milk in that can, and once in a while they would serve mutton, which is uh, a lamb from Australia, and that was awful. The Japanese did not eat in those days uh, bread and potatoes and, and powdered milk and especially mutton. And so we asked the government to let us grow our own food and therefore save the government a lot of money by buying these foods that we don't eat. So we built farms. Here's the camp itself, here's Heart Mountain, and we built farms in that ter territory uh, out of undeveloped land, and we, we brought in water from Yellowstone, and also there's a river run, runs flowing from Yellowstone downstream. We were able to tap into that and irrigate all of the farms, and we, by one year we were able to change our diet uh, to fresh veggies and, and uh, and uh, we had to bring in some rice from other parts of the country because we can't grow rice in northern Wyoming. Uh, but at least we were able to get the kind of foods that we're, we were uh, accustomed to. The winters, uh, as indicated by this illustration uh, by a lady artist in the camp named Estelle Ishigo. And Estelle uh, went around camp trying to uh, create images of what the conditions in the camp were. And one of these is this one here, which turns out to be uh, very famous and important. It's a winter of the blizzards in, of Wyoming, and uh, these kids are going to school in that blizzard wearing typical California clothing. And, and uh, what was difficult is that winter, it got down to minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It was awful. And the wind blowing at about 50 miles an hour, and, and uh, to this day we can still feel it in our bones when we think about those conditions as we uh, look at art by uh, Estelle. The classrooms were like a bare room. There was nothing in it when we first got there, so the first thing that came was benches, and we used the benches for um, uh, tables until they, they built more furniture and, and, and uh, made it look more, more comfortable. I have to stop at this moment because there's a bigger story within the camp, and that is the number of people who volunteered for the U.S. military during World War II. Japanese-American soldiers who, who fought for the U.S. Uh, a total of some 33,000 Japanese-Americans uh, who uh, volunteered and uh, went into the military. 800 of them were from Heart Mountain, so that indicates the, the degree of loyalty. What's unbelievable is they're doing that under the condition that their own families are still in the prison created by the government who's asking them to serve. That's the dichotomy of the situation at the time. So it was very unusual for these people to, um, to uh, serve in the military. Toward the end of our stay, there was a hero. We call him a hero because of the action he took. His name is James Purcell. He's a white civil rights attorney in San Francisco. And he figured out the problem that Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and, and uh, 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 Minyasui had was um, they broke the law. They admitted it, you know, breaking the, the curfew law and other rules that were going on. Uh, and, and they were sent to prison. So they were, in a sense, disloyal to the rules that the government created. So he figured out, We're gonna, I'm going to find a perfect citizen. He found it in this one lady named Mitsuo Endo, E-N-D-O, which the lawyers today know is quite a, a, a milestone uh, case because what, what Purcell did, he filed a lawsuit against the government on the claim that you cannot hold an American citizen in a prison for three years without at least a hearing. And Mitsuo Endo had a perfect record. Never been arrested, never been to Japan, had no association with anyone in Jap Japan. In fact, she worked for the state of California as an employee. And so he filed a lawsuit. It got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court finally said, you're right, that's unconstitutional, let her go. And at the same time, let all the prisoners in these camps go. So that's what broke the doors open, and that's how we got out when the Supreme Court finally changed their mind and let us go. A very, very important case. The day came, though, the trains came back to pick us all up. This is the last train that left massive numbers of people getting on the train. 
and uh, late, uh, uh, late, late 1945, November the 10th, we all left. They took the barracks. The government wanted to, you know, quote, erase the existence of a prison camp. They uh, sold each barrack for $1 a piece and sold it to the local farmers in, in, in that area, northern Wyoming, uh, all the farms. And uh, so the land was cleared, and then they leveled it, and then they gave small parcels of the land uh, to returning veterans from World War II so they can start their own new lives with the former grounds that where the prison used to be. Uh, but they left a few things, in, and I'll point that out in a moment. We were not happy even after they released us because we felt there was a, a, a real wrong that was done to all of us, and we demanded an apology in an activity called redress, redress of, of the mistakes that the government made. And that effort took 50 years to try to gain an apology from, uh, with, with a lot of expert uh, attorneys trying to, uh, to convince Congress. Uh, and, uh, and the major activity during this time was an, an exhibit in Washington, D.C., next to uh, the Congress. Uh, and the exhibit featured at the entrance uh, Dorothea Lange's photograph, and we now call her the poster girl. And, and they, uh, they saw that at the entrance, and inside were photographs of the military soldiers, the Niseis, who were fighting uh, and some got killed in fighting in Italy and France. Uh, and also at the same time, there were exhibits of photographs of families, the soldiers' relatives who were caught behind, uh, not caught, taken behind bars at, at, uh, at the prison camps, including this photograph. This is an important one. This is the family of Sergeant Masuda. That's Kaz Masuda in a uniform uh, the whole family, they, they used to live uh, uh, close to where I live in California, uh, but uh, the entire family, kids, elderly, everyone was in a prison camp when Sergeant Masuda went uh, back into the, the military. He was shipped to Italy and he, kill, he was killed. He died in action uh, right after that. Uh, so with that kind of an image, we sent that to President Roosevelt, uh, President Reagan at that time in 1988. And he finally was uh, convinced, yes, it is now time to apologize. And so um, what, uh, what that resulted in is uh, uh, letters going out to people who were still living. About half of the people, by the way, were, were, were gone. So out of the 120,000, there were some 60,000 people, including myself, who were left. And uh, so uh, we all got letters, like this one here I got, it was until, uh, but two years later when George Bush, the first George Bush, uh, sent me a letter, and uh, in it are the key words that we wanted, sincere apology that we were looking for, along with a, a check to help pay for the losses that we suffered uh, at the time we were removed. Well, to w wind things down, you know, we might be interested, what happened to some of my buddies, like Kobe? Well, he went to Berkeley with me, graduated, became a pharmacist, and he still looks like Kobe, except a little white hair. And uh, he's an okay, he did very, very well as a, a pharmacist. There's another family, Tochi Ito, and her husband, uh, James Ito. James was in charge of the farm operations at Heart Mountain and, and their family. And their son, it turned out to be no less than Lance Ito, the judge at the O.J. Simpson trial. And uh, I see uh, Lance once in a while. Uh, he's a nice guy outside the courtroom, uh, but uh, uh, I don't know inside. Uh, but Lance is a, is a very bright, successful uh, uh, jurist on, on the San in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I went to Berkeley uh, and uh, UCLA graduate school, became an engineer, hired by the Boeing Company as a rocket scientist helped to put up a lot of rockets, including most of the satellites that you people use today, and a very, very uh, enjoyable, rewarding career. What ever happened to the poster girl, mysterious poster girl? Does she ever appear again? Does she disappear? Well, hardly. She grew up, and this is what she looks like today. The eyes look the same, and the nose looks the same, typical Japanese nose. Uh, but uh, uh, she uh, grew up and um, went to college, and uh, she became 
Mrs. Mihara. We've been married for 60 years. <laughs> and uh, we have two daughters and two grandkids, and they're also doing well, except that they're no longer kids. They just graduated from college. And so, so uh, turned out, uh, life turned out relatively okay for us, and we're, we're pleased about that. Heart Mountain today, not too much different. The mountain's still there, but uh, we uh, created a foundation to help create a new museum at the site. Uh, I call it a school because on the outside it looks like barracks, and that reminds me of the schools that I went to in the camp. Inside it looks like a very, very modern schoolhouse, and you walk through one room after another, and we teach people who visit uh, what the life at the camp was about, and they go out and look at the prison site and get a full understanding of what happened. This is a typical group that we, we bring in. We bus in kids from all over, not only Wyoming, but other states on a day trip. And, and we bring them in and we teach them uh, what was important about what happened in the camp and their, their rights as, as U.S. citizens that, that they should enjoy and, and never forget. So it's a, it's a real educational program that uh, we think is, is very worthwhile uh, and we're continuing to do that. We're, we're making further improvements. We're building and re trying to recreate the, the camp itself. What we're finding is barracks, that the original barracks, like this one here, was found in a farm 80 miles away. We bring it in and uh, re uh, put it on a, uh, a site close to that school or museum. So we're, we're now trying to recreate the entire prison by, uh, by doing this process. So it's a very, very active campaign. Uh, I want to briefly switch over to the Lordsburg prison camp and tell you a little about how I came about the, uh, the document uh, that uh, we uh, donated. This is a cover of the diaries. It's a very large uh, document, and the outside cover, the original cover, was made out of cardboard uh, from uh, shipping containers that we had in the camps. And what we did was we, uh, we there were several that were printed uh, and uh, some of the prisoners, like my father-in-law, obtained uh, one of these uh, 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 pages from, from the diary. And this is a typical page. It's all in Japanese characters. And uh, so this page, by the way, describes the killing that you're going to hear about in a moment of the two soldiers at Lordsburg. Uh, and uh, so we're in the process of translating all these. Inside the diaries is a sketch of the... Uh, the the uh, barracks and the facilities at uh, uh, Lordsburg. These are the individual barracks, and there's a mess hall and so forth. So the the design is very similar to that that we had at Heart Mountain. Here's some pictures of Lordsburg. The prisoners uh, at that time was being transferred from Lordsburg to another camp, uh, and uh, uh, here's a sketch of the inside of the barracks. Some hundred people. Uh, uh, crammed into each barrack. Uh, and here are some of the prisoners that were located in uh, Lordsburg. Uh, quickly summarizing the comparison, the left column are the highlights of the Hart Mountain camp, and the right side is the uh, features of the Lordsburg camp. Like Hart Mountain had 10 to 15 or 14,000 people, Lordsburg had between 1,000 to 200, uh, 2,500 people. The uh, Heart Mountain was families, and the uh, Lordsburg was all men, uh, Issei's. Uh, the density, we had 25 prisoners per barrack, uh, and some were allowed to move back east if they wanted to move, but not to the west coast. Uh, at Lordsburg, we had some 100 prisoners per barrack, not allowed to leave under any circumstance. We had schools because we had kids at Heart Mountain, and there were no shootings by the guards but at uh, Lordsburg, uh, there were no schools, and in this case, there were two uh, prisoners who were shot and killed. So with that, uh, I'm going to transition then um, back to Nikki to describe uh, some of the details uh, in that diary. And so, uh, Nikki? Thanks, Sam. And you're going to join us in the reading of, uh, of, of the diaries. Uh, so, Herb, can you be here? 
Molly Pressler, curator of the Lordsburg Museum, has extensively researched the Lordsburg prison camp. After the Japanese uh, Issei were incarcerated there, um, Italian and German prisoners of war were, were also there. And, and the Issei men were then transferred to Santa Fe. So this has led to um, a little bit of confusion because many people still feel that these Issei men who were in Lordsburg uh, at the beginning uh, were Japanese soldiers who were captured in Japan instead of uh, older men who had lived in the United States for a long time and who had been prevented from becoming citizens due to the early Asian exclusion laws. Um, so Molly has researched why Lordsburg was designated as a site of this uh, permanent enemy alien detention camp. Like my father, you know, as I said, uh, my father had come to the, my father was born in 1888. And he came to the United States to attend university. And he loved America, he loved the freedom of America, so he stayed and married and had uh, a child. And therefore, on December 7th, 1941, he was, you know, kind of fell th between the tracks. Um, and like many uh, thousands of, of Issei men. Sir? The Lordsburg camp was the only camp run by the U.S. Army to be built specifically for enemy aliens. And it was the Army's largest center for their incarceration. So why was Lordsburg chosen? It's a remote area, it has level terrain, and is not heavily populated. It has access to railroads, a coast-to-coast -coast highway, and is relatively near to other military installations. It has, it has an airport and its own resources for water, gas, and electricity. Buildings began in February of 1942 and continued into 1943 bringing an economic boon to Lordsburg. There were 283 buildings, some of which were built with the help of Issei uh, carpenters. In the middle of the camp, there were three compounds designed to hold 3,000 men. Each compound had 10 barracks, which would billet 200 men, two mess halls, and two latrines. Lordsburg townspeople felt tense upon hearing that Japanese were coming in June of 1942. But once they were there, it was hard to see any threat to those, uh, by those mostly older men, average age, 55, who seemed of calm demeanor. Tenseness, however, increased inside the camp for the internees. They objected to harsh treatment given them by the army. They were required to clean up the mess hall, soldiers' latrines, and infirmaries to level and clean up the grounds to dig post holes in the cemetery enclosures, and to go to Lordsburg for loading quartermaster supplies, etc., all outside of their compounds and without payment in money as per the minimum wage outlined in the Geneva Convention for class two labor. The pay they did receive was in coupons worth about 10 cents a day. They pointed out the Geneva Con Convention when they <coughs> stated that they were required to work only within their compounds, that any work outside their compounds must be strictly voluntary and be paid. So when on July 13th they were ordered to furnish 72 men for afternoon detail, the internees unanimously decided that they were unable to comply with this order. This was judged by the administration as disobedience. A lockdown was imposed on the camp and all internees were required to be confined to their barracks 24 hours a day, Sundays not accepted, 
except for meals and utilization of latrines. To surrender the radios. Discontinue canteen services. Turn out the lights by 8 p.m. Keep barrack doors closed day and night. Furthermore, all mail, incoming and outgoing, was to be held up indefinitely. So this was the tense atmosphere existing at the camp on July 27, 1942. On this date, the Army received incoming internees by train from Fort Bismarck, North Dakota. As the internees were walking the two miles to the camp, one military guard shot two Issei, Mr. Toshio Kobata and Mr. Hirota Isomura, for ostensibly trying to escape. The guard's version was, They tried to run. I called halt three times, and they did not. The officer of the day went out and collected the shells, and he said, They ought to strike a medal for the shooter. Word went around town that the men had been trying to run. Some townspeople considered the guard a hero and offered him meals and drinks, and even took up a collection of money for him. Others wondered why these men would even try to escape out there on that desolate landscape. There is practically a 360 degree view. One can see from horizon to horizon. Where would they go? A military court martial was held at Fort Bliss and the guard was cleared. In 1999, when Molly Pressler read the court transcript, she learned what had not been told. According to testimony given by Issei, who had known these people for years, the two had been physically unable to run, were not, kind, were not the kind of people men, men to do so, and they were shot as an example. Questionable circumstances indeed. July 27th, 1942. This was the day Mr. Kobota and Mr. Hisonu were killed. This was the day the lockdown was lifted. So the following comes from the log kept by the Issei men of Lordsburg, translated from the Japanese by Ikuko Begay and edited by, by myself and donated by Frank Miyahara. This section had to do with the details of the uh, diary concerning the timeline of the unnatural deaths of Mr. Kobata and Mr. Isamura. At 1.45 in the morning on July 27, 1942, 147 new Japanese internees arrived from an internment camp in Bismarck, North Dakota. They were guarded by American soldiers, and the non-scheduled train that transported them arrived on this prairie in New Mexico. Tens of American soldiers with guns surrounded these internees around the train. There was a major, the leader of that group, who stepped down from the train. A sergeant who was in the guarding group rushed out to the major and stood at attention. The major told the sergeant that the major was handing over 147 internees to place into the Lordsburg prison, including two of them who were sick at that time. Then the internees got off the train in order, the first train, the second train, the third train, and they stood in three rows at a corner where the guards surrounded them. After they lined up, the sergeant said, there are supposed to be two people in this group who are sick. Those two come out of the row and wake, wait until a car picks you up. The two sick men immediately stepped out of the row as ordered. Upon seeing them, the sergeant immediately walked to the right of the rows of men and ordered the group to march. The full moon was bright in the high sky. Everything on the prairie was very quiet, as if it was sleeping e eternally. The internees walked with their heads down without even drawing a breath. The guards surrounding them kept the same formation and proceeded along with the inter in internees. The internees marched 
evenly in longitudinal rows. The moonlight cast a dim light on the railroad tracks. The vehicle that would pick up the sick internees had not come yet. Expecting that the vehicle would come from the barracks area ahead, the internees alternated looking at the barracks ahead and the tracks behind, the distance increasing between them and their starting point. And when they walked for 15 or 16 minutes, they realized from the headlights that a vehicle was approaching behind them. The vehicle's headlights finally reached the inter internees and it slowed down to the walking speed. As the bright lights prevented the internees from seeing as they walked, the sergeant ordered the driver to turn off the lights and the order was passed down from soldier to soldier when the order reached the vehicle. The vehicle lights were turned off, still the vehicle continued to follow the party. A while later, the engine charged and passed the men on the left side uh, of the column if, as if the driver was angered by the group slowing down. And uh, then it quickly disappeared from their sight. It was a two-door sedan coupe, but it did not appear the sick persons were inside that car. If the sick people were in it, at least it should have been driven carefully. For this reason, some people thought that wasn't it. Maybe the vehicle to pick up the sick people will come from the barracks ahead. About the time the party reached a well-lit building on the left, ahead of and closest to the barracks, one vehicle had come out of the barracks area. It came fast to the right in front of the party, passed the party on the shoulder, and stopped at the entrance of the building. Then the driver and a soldier disappeared into the building. The lights confirmed that the vehicle was a military truck. The building seemed to be a bar or a recreation room. The information about the sick people who had difficulty walking must have been given to the previous authority, to this authority. Why had they arranged adequate, why had they, not arranged adequately before the train arrived. Are those two sick internees still standing by the railroad in the prairie waiting for a, a vehicle to pick them up? How long are we going to be in this situation with such extremely rude treatment from the soldier aiming uh, a go cold gun at us? The internees felt their impending future with horror and rage. The party finally reached the entrance of the camp at 3 a.m. Thus, then a roll call was taken by a second lieutenant and 145 internees, except the two sick internees, were forced into the wired, fenced camp. Soon after dawn, someone started to mention that the two sick internees, Mr. Kobata and Mr. Isamura, who had been separated from the party were shot to death by a soldier. The rumor spread that they were shot because they tried to escape. We were stunned to hear the rumor because Mr. Kovata has been suffering from lung disease for a long time. He's been bedridden in the hospital at that last camp in Bismarck and he had to be transported to uh, Lordsburg on a stretcher. Mr. Is Isamura had fallen when he tried to move from a pier to a fishing boat. He damaged his spinal cord more than 10 years ago. He had trouble walking and he could walk only for five feet, stop, and then walk again and stop. And most of us could not believe the two had attempted to escape under such conditions. Many people fo came forward saying, I heard two gunshots while the roll call was being made last night. I heard three gunshots, said another. And moreover, among the internees who had been there before us, one by one, they came forward saying, my sleep was shattered by these gunshots. We vowed to find out the truth, as we fellow Japanese had helped one another during the six months of confinement at that last camp in Bismarck. The 34 concerned people rushed to the dispensary. As a hospital building had not been completed at that time, 
All sick internees were laid side by side in a small room next to the dispensary. All medical staff was Japanese. We asked about the two sick beat persons. No one was admitted, was the reply. Then where did the two go? Were they temporarily hospitalized in Lordsburg? Or like the rumor, were they shot down at, at dawn for escaping as in spite of the warning shot? At least we decided to ask a military doctor on, on the phone. We were relieved to get the answer from him that the two were being treated in another place. On the next day, the 28th, a message from a military doctor uh, announced that uh, Isamura and Kobata had been shot to death at dawn yesterday because they had attempted to escape. So the diary translation goes on in this vein. Uh, ten witnesses, Issei witnesses who knew these men, were selected to uh, t testify at the preliminary hearing and later on at the court-martial. And as uh, Molly Pressler has reported, uh, the soldier Poston was uh, acquitted and considered by many a, a hero in his town. Uh, so much more research and study and further translations of the diary needs to be done, which we intend to do. And so that uh, allows me to segue to um, a, a scholar and also to a JSCL board member uh, who would uh, like to tell you about our current uh, activities on Japanese American experience in addition to the, these uh, translation diaries. Thanks a lot, you guys. Victor Yamada, board member and coordinator of special projects. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to um, first start off with a couple of uh, very recent uh, announcements that I think are very pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, you might remember in uh, Sam's presentation, he mentioned uh, three men who uh, resisted the uh, uh, imprisonment action by the government. And the third one was uh, Men Yasui. Uh, we've just heard, uh, actually it's been published widely, the White House on Monday announced that uh, Min Yasui will be one of the ones that will be receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So that's, <laughs> I think as you appreciate that is the highest civilian honor that can be received. And um, it's, it's, I think if some of you have heard or w will see, it's an interesting list. It's, it's alphabetical, it starts with Yogi Berra and it includes uh, Councilwoman uh, Shirley Chisholm, uh, includes entertainers, etc. But um, uh, obviously, most important to us as Japanese Americans is that uh, Min Yasui is on that list uh, posthumous, posthumously. Um, the the second announcement is actually related also to Min Yasui. And again, good news: um, Nikki and the uh, New Mexico JACL last week heard from the uh, New Mexico Humanities Council that we've won uh, a grant to uh, put on what we call the uh, Citizen Min. Min Yasui in New Mexico story. And uh, very briefly, without going into too much detail, um, Min Yasui, during the redress activity that Sam referred to, made a visit to New Mexico. Uh, it was part of a JCL conference in Albuquerque. And um, um, on the same dais was uh, Senator Pete Domenici. Um, uh, Min was here to uh, push for a redress and, and at the time that he was on the dais and talking directly to Pete Domenici, he was able to convince uh, Senator Domenici to swing to support the, the redress legislation. So that was one of a, obviously one of many important actions to, to get redress adopted by uh, the legislature and then ultimately by uh, 
President Reagan signing the, uh, the law. So uh, we're going to be telling that story uh, and um, we'll be traveling again throughout the state with that particular story. Uh, a number of the people with JCL and others are still living who were at that, at that particular conference. So we have uh, a lot of verification that that, that happened in a, in a public uh, situation. So again, two bits of good news that I wanted to mention. Um, what um, I'll do next is briefly summarize our, our current major project, the New Mexico JCL, and that's uh, confinement in the land of enchantment, Japanese Americans in New Mexico during World War II, and we use the acronym CLO. As you've heard from uh, uh, all of our speakers, uh, Japanese Americans were imprisoned in New Mexico during World War II. Uh, New Mexico JCL, in conjunction with Colorado State University, the uh, Public Lands History Center there, we're, we're doing a, a joint project to document the imprisonment um, and educate the public on this uh, chapter of World War II New Mexico history. Uh, the, the project is primarily funded by the National Park Service, part of their Japanese American Confinement Sites program. Uh, there is a matching requirement which involves private donations and so forth, but it's, uh, the principal funding is from the National Park Service. We're addressing four confinement sites. I think you remember on the map that uh, Sam indicated, the three are mentioned there. Uh, Santa Fe is the largest, Lordsburg, a uh, smaller one in Fort Stanton, Lincoln County. There's actually also a fourth confinement site that did exist, and that's in uh, uh, the old Raton, Raton Ranch, again in Lincoln County. Um, just to clarify just a bit here, uh, the, the three largest ones, a, as it have been said, housed um, men, uh, what were supposed to be uh, high, high security risk individuals that were brought from different parts of the country into New Mexico in these three sites. Uh, the fourth one, uh, Old Raton Ranch, is a special case. Um, some of you may know this. Uh, in Clovis, there were 32 Japanese who were living in Clovis uh, probably since the 1920s, primarily working for the railroad. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, there was really quite a um, racial tension that developed there, and the federal government uh, took those 32 individuals, men, women and, and children to Old Raton Ranch for, for their quote, protection. So they were combined there for a short while uh, and then they were dispersed to the, the major camps that have been referred to. But, but that confinement site did exist uh, under government operation during that time frame. Um, I want to mention that in the CLO project we're really going, we're going to be really including some uh, uh, a lot of material that's never been seen by the public. And I want to give you four examples just to illustrate that. Uh, one is actually one that's already been talked about. This is the Lordsburg Prisoner's Diary that uh, uh, Sam's family has contributed and uh, there were some translations uh, given from that. Uh, the second uh, example, actually letters from both Lordsburg and Santa Fe camp. The same individual wrote letters back to his family in Hawaii while he was imprisoned. And they were in Japanese, but we translated those so that uh, they can be looked at and you can appreciate the sort of the, the high points that he points out about, you know, uh, in the camp in Santa Fe and, and obviously the suffering and the, and, and the anguish that, that he went through. And you can still see that tone, even though it's censored, there's a lot of words that are blocked out by the, by the government censor. But, uh, those have been translated uh, and are available, or will be, will be referred to in the, in the project. Um, <clears throat> a third example, in, in the Santa Fe camp, uh, there was a, a medical doctor who was picked up in Portland, Oregon, and eventually ended up in Santa Fe, and he served as the de facto medical officer there. Um, he helped assemble a scrap album during the time that he was there, and uh, to me, it's quite interesting. It contains uh, original watercolors. There's very nice pictures painted of the landscape around, around the camp, obviously from the inside, looking outside through the bars. Uh, there's calligraphy. There's poems that were written by the prisoners. Uh, the, the last set of pages that I find very interesting, uh, barrack by barrack, the people in the, the prisoners in those barracks sign their name 
both in Japanese and in English, and they also put down their home address, where they came from. So you can actually see the people's names and you can see where they came from uh, exactly and, and where they were hoping probably to return. So to me, that's a, a, an extra emotional uh, bit of information when you look at that. Uh, a number of the pages were in Japanese, so we're, we're in the process of translating those to, to English to make it easier for, for people who want to look at it. Um, uh, another example I want to mention, uh, this was a Santa Fe prisoner, Santa Fe camp prisoner. He collected rocks on the property as well as probably a few times when they were able to have excursions outside the camp uh, borders and put together a simple rock collection, did some polishing to make it look prettier and so forth. Uh, when, when he was released from the camp, he wanted to take that collection with him, but the government said, no, you couldn't take that. So the government kept that, and then about five to seven years later, uh, he had moved to Japan. They found him, and they, they sent it to him, so he was obviously very happy to have that. Uh, we have some of the family history. We're working with the family to try to get this collection probably donated to the New Mexico History Museum. Um, so that, that's, that's another uh, individual memento or uh, artifact. Uh, the last one I'll mention is um, in, in Santa Fe, and he also spent time in Lordsburg, was a, uh, a Buddhist priest who was imprisoned. Um, he was trained in Japan uh, in Buddhism, and he also was trained in the US and was picked up in the US. Uh, he kept a diary from uh, December 7th, 1941 to the, to the day that he was uh, released. Uh, it's all in Japanese, it's about a thousand pages. Uh, a certain number of the pages have been translated from Japanese to English, and some re researchers have used it to write uh, short articles, but we're trying to pursue getting that uh, much more significantly translated. And, and, and I think, to me, I think the importance of seeing or hearing his words, again, is by someone who was trained you know, in Buddhism, both in Japan and in, uh, in the US, and how he viewed incarceration, imprisonment, and, and his observations. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to be an even more substantial uh, <coughs> documentation to look at. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to mention th these examples, again, there's, from a number standpoint, there were 6,000 prisoners that went through these four confinement sites, you know, through the total amount of time, not at the, all at the same time. But that's still 6,000 individual stories. And uh, I think when, when you can look at the individual situation, their experience, what they might have expressed, I think that adds to your understanding of the uh, imprisonment experience. Uh, we do have oral histories of some of the folks that were, were or are still alive, so they, their uh, experiences are said in their own, own words. And again, those will be available um, in the project. The, uh, the project itself, in terms of schedule, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, but the, this, the three tasks within the project are first to put down historic markers at the sites uh, if they don't already exist. The second is to prepare and publish a, an outreach publication that documents the experience at the four sites. And, <clears throat> and the third is to put together a website so that the public can access all of the materials that we've collected. Like, like you all know, in today's world, good websites really allow that to, to uh, be accessed. So we're putting that together. The, the schedule for this is uh, um, we're on target to finish all of this by the spring of next year. And, and I can fully attest to that because we, we on the team are currently reviewing the draft sections of all this material. So we're, we're very much on target and we expect to have that released in, in a few months. Um, after that's done, what we would like to do is pursue a next phase where we would organize a traveling exhibit of the material and take it around the state to help educate students and the general public so they, they uh, see the materials and see some of us talk about the, uh, the, the product of this project. Uh, we're going to be pursuing funding and, and so forth, so, but we hope to be successful in that. Again for the overall goal is we want to document this chapter of uh, New Mexico history and then provide the information so we can uh, educate the public about this uh, uh, time in World War II. Um, outside in the lobby, I've got some of the materials. Uh, I, I did have a project summary, eight pages, but I think a number of you already picked that up. If you're interested in that, I've got a sign-up sheet and I can 
uh, email that to you electronically if you're interested. It's, it's a very good eight-page summary of our project. Uh, and then I've also got some other materials that are uh, uh, images from the camps, um, some of which you've seen from Sam's presentation, et cetera, but we've got some other ones to illustrate the resource material that we have. Um, those are all things that we're uh, keeping and will include in the project as we, as we um, uh, finish that up in the spring. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the panel and with uh, Dr. Russell. Okay, and I just want to mention, speaking of stories, um, the reason Victor and I wrote a grant uh, called Men, or Citizen Men in New Mexico was because we were working with an oral history project of um, uh, stories of Asian Americans in New Mexico. And three of the people we interviewed told us this Minyasui story, Minyasui and Pete Domenici story. I mean, all separately, all in, in, in different ways. And so I told Hale Yasui, his daughter, about this because she has created a documentary on her father called um, Never Give Up, narrated by George Takei, and it's opening at the Los Angeles um, Japanese American History Museum uh, next year. And, uh, and then she uh, and I have collaborated on a play on her dad, which portrays what um, Sam was talking about, his arrest and so forth and his civil liberties trial. So Holly, uh, his daughter, did not know about these stories about Pete Domenici. And right after the opening of her play in Lo of her film in Los Angeles, she said, I want to start my, my tour of the states in New Mexico. So therefore, our project is called Citizen Men in New Mexico. And, and for him to be nominated with Shirley Chisholm and Yogi Berra. I mean, how American can you get? So now back to Lordsburg and our scholar. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Andy Russell. Uh, he's you know, good enough to come out tonight with a cold and in spite of his very busy schedule, He's a professor of history whose scholarship specializes in the history of Japanese Americans of the interior West. Uh, he, his dissertation is on the Japanese railroad and mining communities, and he's a historian working on the CLO project. Dr. Andy Russell. Um, some history on the Lordsburg camp, and it seems like they did a really good job of covering that history. Uh, so I'm not really sure why I'm here. Um, maybe for the question and answer section. Um, but I will tell you that uh, I'm an amateur musician. I should know how to work with this thing here. All right. I guess you can hear me pretty well. Um, no, I started as a graduate student in Las Vegas, Nevada at, at U, uh, UNLV uh, doing work with the Japanese American community there on a um, fairly small scale community project that was called um, Nevada's Strength and Diversity. We were playing off a Smithsonian traveling exhibit on Japanese American women. Um, and uh, so we put together a nice little exhibit and I worked with the community and um, you know, it was, a, it was a rewarding experience. I went on to finished my PhD program at Arizona State and I got to get involved with the Japanese community there and the JACL and um, again I saw a lot of you know uh, energy and activity and we put together a nice museum exhibit as part of that project but I have to say that this New Mexico uh, Japanese American community is just blowing me away uh, with this involvement in the CLO project. I mean they're just maturing and finding pulling documents out of the out of the blue and developing things, and particularly Victor is uh, doing some really incredible work. And um, you know, for a small community, uh, they really do have a lot of great human resources and a lot of energy. And um, 
they're capturing very unique New Mexico stories. And, you know, uh, that's my fascination with the Japanese Americans of the interior West is uh, their stories oftentimes are, you know, very um, strange and uh, different. They go along a different path than the traditional narrative of what happened to the Japanese Americans who lived along the West Coast. And, and you know, as, um, as Sam mentioned, 80% of the population was concentrated, at least the mainland population was concentrated in California when the war happened. And so there's a lot of literature and a lot of documentary evidence on their experiences, uh, but the interior um, stories get overlooked, uh, including these little, uh, or these smaller internment camps that were located here in New Mexico. So uh, we're helping to bring a lot of those stories to life and showing the contrasts and uh, the work has been really fascinating. And, and again, uh, it's so, you know, exciting just to see the, the community taking charge of this and, and uh, sustaining it and moving it on to the next level. So that's all I have to say. There we go. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some Q&A. Before I announce, some of you uh, may have to leave, but please pick up your DVD, and if you leave a contribution, it'll keep the buses going to keep the school kids coming to our, our school. That really would help out. Um, and uh, don't forget to leave your feedback sheets on the table, if you will. Uh, does anybody have any questions? We'll try to do our best to answer them. Uh, yes, on the end, please. I have a lot of questions. Families get separated, children get separated away from their parents in this process of. of uh, I can't hear. Would you repeat the question, please? Oh, thank you. I, I just want to know if, if uh, there's any documentation of children being separated from their parents. Uh, were they were lost separately or permanently? Uh, well, I, I can tell you what happened in Har Mountain. Uh, it was a family camp, and. Uh, there was no physical separation of the kids from the families once they got into the camp. Uh, there, has, there is an actual uh, experience of orphans who didn't have no parents uh, who, who uh, were placed in orphans in San Francisco and two in Los Angeles, 150 of them. And those orphans went to this one camp, Manzanar, in California, and they created an orphan's village, a children's village, inside the compound. So there's a prison within a prison. And, and that's where the orphans wound up. One of those, by the way, is the mayor of South San Francisco today, <laughs> uh, an orphan who was in that orphan's village. And uh, with the internment camps, you know, they, he said they were picked up under, you know, because they were under suspicion. The FBI had a list of, uh, you know, community leaders, basically. Right. Uh, so they were separated from their families for years. And the kids would have been separated from their fathers. And I have one other question. Has anybody filed a FOIA to try and get uh, documents through, uh, through FOIA? Because sometimes it really is rich. They're, right. They won't, most, they most, won't block everything out. Yeah, most of the um, relocation records and even the internment files of people that were sent to DOJ camps, um, they've been collected by scholars already and they're archived in different places. There's a whole records group. Um, that's been released and opened up. Uh, but I did have the experience of trying to file a FOIA in my research and, uh, with the FBI, and it took like six Would years. Would you explain what that is? Oh, Freedom of Information Act six request. Six years? Yeah, the FBI stalled me and stalled me and stalled me. And it was interesting because uh, the railroad and mining community were fighting for a separate redress battle that they had to fight. And um, as soon as they got their redress, I got my FBI files. So it was like the government was sort of, you know, Holding those back for whatever so reason. Line of two state follows mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, in the back, wait. I wonder if you know whether, out of all of the Japanese Americans who were interned in the U.S., how many not only survived the camps but returned to live and stay in the United States? The question is, uh, of the people sent to the camps, um, how many or what percentage return to live in the United States? Oh, okay. About, uh, let me put the question the other way. Uh, a 
number of people elected during the war to be uh, sent to Japan. Uh, and they were placed in a camp in uh, California, the Chile Lake camp, uh, in a holding position. And uh, there were supposed to be negotiations going on for transfer of Americans who were caught in Japan to make the transfer to the people who wanted to go back to Japan. And therefore, by the way, they're losing their citizenship if the families went. Uh, that did take place. It was not a large number, but there was a group of people who, who did give up their citizenship and went to Japan uh, as a result. Uh, but what, the majority, you know, like most of us do, we didn't want to go back to Japan. And we wanted to stay here in the U.S. And so we, we stayed. And, and, uh, There's no going back to Japan if you weren't from Japan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you were born in the United States, this is the country you're from. Yeah, we were Americans. But now they're working on those East Day that were sent to the camps here in New Mexico, for instance. Uh, some of them, especially if they were single, single men, uh, they might have wanted to repatriate back to Japan, and a good number of them did. Um, and even when they saw the destruction, you know, and knew that they were going back to a, a country that was devastated, by being you know, stuck in camps here by America for three years, a lot of them were disenchanted. And we're talking about specifically you know, Issei, who were uh, segregated into these camps. And that um, third camp that we're mentioning, the uh, one at Fort Stanton, it was a segregation center for people who wanted to renounce their citizenship. Um, and interestingly enough, the people sent to this uh, this little camp at Fort Stanton, which was very high security. Um, a good number of them, if not the majority, were actually um, Nisei, but Nisei who had been raised in Japan and known as um, Kibe. 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 And so they were very ultra patriotic, you know, they'd been raised in Japan in the 1930s. And so they came to them, they were segregated out of the normal relocation camps, and they were sent to Santa Fe, and they got a bunch of trouble there by. You know, doing bonsai salutes and celebrating the emperor's birthday. So the government isolated them again and stuck them at that little camp at Fort Staten. And uh, many of them did repatriate to Japan. But how many survived the camps? Oh, Roughly. how many Roughly. survived the camps? How many survived the camps? Uh, well, all 120,000 120, were released, those who, did, who lived in the camp. Uh, but there were people who died in the camp. My grandfather died in the camp uh, on, uh, with cancer. It was a brutal death. But regardless, uh, 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 and we were losing, by the way, about 150 prisoners per month uh, overall, all the camps. Uh, but uh, the majority of them went back to their homes in California, maybe about 90 percent. 10 percent probably moved back east uh, uh, to uh, possible new careers uh, back east. But uh, most of us went back home. Um, I want to add a little bit to the question that you asked about the, the uh, search for information. And, and I think for two reasons. One is obviously a lot of the information was able to be looked at from, from uh, government records. And I think to me one of the interesting things, and I think uh, a lot of you would think about it, is why were people starting to be picked up right on December 7th? And you know, through the look at the records, obviously those, those highly suspect lists existed well before, you know, December 7, 1941. Uh, I think uh, Andy looked at some of these records. Uh, uh, they date back into the 1930s. And wow. so people's names were put on those, quote, suspect lists. And then when December 7 happened, uh, literally there were lots of people picked up exactly on the 7th, December 7. Mm -hmm. Talk about examples here. So, so I think People need to realize that that was you know, already in place, and when the action formally by the government started, they went right to those lists. Can I add something to that? But, yeah, it was called the ABC list. They had you know, a category A that was considered especially dangerous, and B that was somewhat dangerous, and they listed the dangerousness of these individuals. <laughs> but you know, the files that I looked at when I was doing research in, on uh, people in Nevada, uh, the, the charges were, you know, very spurious. It was like somebody just gave a, an off-the-cuff remark about someone, and it triggered them. They knew on the list, yes. and most of the people that got, ended up on the list, they were there because they were journalists, or they had business connections to Japan, 
or maybe they'd been an officer in the Japanese army 20 years earlier. So, you know, and sort of the salient, um, you know, fact to remember is that nobody in the internment camps included uh, was ever convicted of any, you know, crimes of espionage. Um, it was just sort of this, we're going to be safe to, rather than sorry to round up everybody that we, you know, think might be suspicious. And there's also an element of grabbing the community leaders to where the government wanted to sort of hold the um, community leaders hostage in camps in the interior. That argument has been made uh, just in case Americans in, you know, on Japanese soil were threatened. Uh, we have your special people, uh, so you know, let's exchange people in that regard. Well, we, were, we were at war with Germany and um, Italy for years. Were any uh, Germans, oh, German Americans or Italian Americans ever rounded up? Let me answer the question. Uh, I told you about the military commanders on the West Coast and the East Coast, and they, they, it was up to them, they made their own decision. There were a lot of Italian Americans and German Americans on the East Coast. The industries in the East Coast had hired many of the Germans and Italian uh, Americans, uh, similar to the whole, uh, Japanese in, in Hawaii. And, uh, those uh, commanders of the industry urged that don't pull these people back into the camps. The government did take a few of the high-risk people, and they went to these uh, uh, DOJ camps, uh, but the majority of the families stayed put. Uh, and it was a unique situation, therefore, in, in the West Coast, that Japanese were, uh, were in Hawaii, the same thing, uh, the Japanese in Hawaii. Uh, the industry, the pineapple industry, and everybody else would hurt bad if they were removed. So they convinced the government not to move them. Mm -hmm. Too much. Japan, uh, uh, Hawaii would collapse if they'd done what they did. The right. economy awesome. of Hawaii would have collapsed yeah. if all of the Japanese had been removed like they were in California. Shu has had her hand up. She's the project manager of the Asian American Legacy Stories. We go around the state taking oral histories of the Asian American elders. Can I just add to that answer? Um, Angel, I don't know how many of you know Angel Island. Angel Island was the... That is our Ellis Island. Right, for uh, the Chinese. And so there were a few German uh, that were interred, I think, during World War II. The question I have is for Mr. Mahar, and that is you use the term prisoners. Um, and I didn't hear from the other speakers and when you read the history books, they don't use the term prisoners. So can you comment on that? Uh, sure, and maybe uh, Herb and, and Victor would like to add. Uh, I've done some research on the terminology, and uh, uh, I believe the uh, words like uh, imprisonment and words like incarceration uh, are accurate because those are the conditions I showed you in the pictures and that's what we experience at these camps. Uh, the phrase the government used called relocation centers was absolutely uh, not the right term. Some people use the, the word uh, uh, internment uh, and, and these terms are really not the, the uh, accurate per portrayal of what happened. You know, when you're forcibly removing people uh, to go into a, uh, an imprisonment, uh, uh, you can't call them relocation, as if it were a fire going on and they're going to temporarily leave and go back. It's, 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 a, it's a different a definition. I really believe it's, it's a correct terminology to uh, uh, label us uh, properly. And, and it's the terminology, right. current terminology of the National <laughs> Japanese American Citizens League. Yeah. Trying to get past the euphemisms, you know, relocation, assembly center. Right? Yeah, and, and a couple, two cents worth. Um, uh, again, it, it is a very, terminology, uh, that whole area is a very big subject. And so, you know, it's, it's been researched and discussed quite a bit as far as what, what to call the, the situation that the Japanese Americans were subject to. But, but I, I agree with what, what we're saying at the end. But I do want to add, I, I just listened to a scholar talk about this. In, and she said that in the very beginning, the government actually started by using the term concentration camps. And, and this was before the Jewish uh, uh, situation became, you know, was, was known by the world. But, but the government, in trying to find words to use for, 
what they were planning to do to Japanese Americans, they used the word concentration camps. Um, obviously, for a lot of reasons, that evolved away from that because what what happened here was not the same severity as as the uh, what the Nazis were doing with uh, with the Jewish uh, folks. But um, uh, again, as Sam said, uh, the government was quite often using words obviously to try to soften the the the, uh, the action, but. I think imprisonment, incarceration, properly speaks toward what uh, what happened. Yes, sir. What? What's? Can you give us a general sense of those who went home? How many were able to reoccupy their land, or were given compensation for the land that they had left? Uh, the question had to do with the, the uh, damages or the, the loss of property. We. A lot of people, I don't have the numbers, but a lot of people lost their homes because they were forced to sell because they figured they needed money. Uh, did you know the bank, the, the government forced the banks to close our accounts, that is freeze it. We could not get money out and, and get ready for the travel. So that was the problem. We had to sell a lot of our property. Some people couldn't afford to keep their houses because they didn't have somebody to maintain it. Now, our family dad had the, had the wisdom to do everything he could to keep the house in San Francisco and he found somebody who was able to keep it. So uh, there were uh, the worst case of all are some of the counties in California passed a law, passed a law that Japanese were not allowed to return to their counties and farm mm -hmm. of all things. But that, that stood in, in, uh, in their area for, for a long time until the, the law was repealed and they were able to, but well, by that time they changed careers. I mean, that was a real economic impact for some people. Several people were subject to that kind of problem. Anyone else? There was a diaspora. Um, the Quakers and other organizations, church groups, and um, uh, civil liberties organizations sponsored uh, Japanese Americans to leave the camp uh, to the West, uh, to the Midwest. Uh, so many people did not return to the West Coast. I grew up in Chicago. Because, uh, because my mother uh, did not refuse to return uh, to the West Coast. Uh, so, in a way, that was uh, uh, the way we you know, reached the, the, the rest of the, of the country. But very few people got their possessions or their farmland. And the, the Imperial Valley in California is a perfect example of that. I mean, that was a, such a desolate area that only the Japanese uh, you know, uh, took it up. And they hand irrigated it, it and made it, you know, the breadbasket of, of uh, you know, the, the, uh, of America. And then that was taken away from them. And some of the communities had four days, six days, eight days to get out. So, you know, if the community leaders, if the men are taken away, this is, you know, 1942. I mean, the women didn't know what to do with your mortgage or your possessions, and then you were told to take only what you can carry. So if you're uh, an immigrant mother, you know, with small children, you know, what, what does your three-year-old carry? Her teddy bear. And you also didn't know where you were going. So in Seattle, there were people, you know, um, at the, um, in Herb's neighborhood, Herb's neighborhood was, the stop where we were ordered to go, where, where the army trucks would come and pick us up. And some people had three and four suits on, you know, under, under their clothes because you didn't know what kind of weather con conditions you were going to. And, you know, one uh, Issei woman in line said, I think they're going to shoot us. So, um, you know, this, this was the condition of the times. Very short notice to get out. So you sell your truck for $50. You sell your grand piano for $100. One woman broke all of her dishes that she had brought from Japan that, she, that her children were going to inherit because a second-hand dealer offered her $25 for a, a full dinner set, you know, for 20 And it's like the general pattern was that the Issei generation had built their lives you know, on the farms and businesses and when they went back, they never recovered. You know, they, uh, but their children you know, went on to get educations and, and excelled and, you know, that generation came up and established itself, but, you know, they just weren't, didn't have the resources or the energy to start over at age 50 or 60. So, you know, that generation was pretty devastated. 
power structure in the family. Uh, the, you know, the Nisei, the older kids, would be the ones that had to sort of in, uh, help the parents along through the camp bureaucracy and you know, sort of take over the affairs of the family. Uh, so, yeah, so generation-wise, you can see the real you know, tragedy in that, in that sense. Uh, two more questions. That's the last one. Yes. Uh, I I just wanted to say thank you all very much, but um, one of the things that was mentioned uh, that I may miss because I didn't know where the space was, um, it, it was, was that you had talked about the JACL being, um, in, in the other presentation on Saturday, being a civil rights organization and that you don't want this to happen again. And I'm lis listening to the propaganda and the behavior of the uh, governors and the mayors and where these camps were going to be, and I'm looking at the news today, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of difference yeah. in the craziness and the hysteria <laughs> relative to um, Syrian refugees. More and money. I just, I wish we'd stop being so horrible. But I just, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for an outstanding presentation and all the work you're doing. Thank you. that I've done, but I think that the American government knew there was an attack imminent. So when the seventh, seventh, you know, when the when they hit uh, Pearl Harbor, they knew they knew something in advance of that. It's, and, and the other thing I want to mention, that's just what I think, that there was there was a, a, a foreknowledge of what was coming. And that's why they they they, they had plans already laid out and, and, and acted them on that same day. And the other thing I just want to remind, I don't know exactly how it plugs in, but uh, with the Nazis, after the war, they brought hundreds of Nazis to this country and, and forgave them. And they, I'm talking about SS officers, okay, not just the grunts that, uh, that came to this country and, and became American citizens. And some of them had some pretty uh, devastating uh, backgrounds of having committed murder against hundreds of people, thousands of people. I, you know, I just sort of throw it out there because I, somehow I see, it, I see a connection or a pattern, maybe it's better to put it. But, uh, the, the level of, of, of conniving that goes on, uh, I, I think it was, it was also happening with Japanese people at the same time. It, it, was, it was kind of like the kind of slavery. Right. The, the broader question, which I always address in my talks, is, uh, is you know, what have we learned since World War II? And, and I keep going back to almost a lot of other people who were almost in prison. You know, take after the Cuban Missile Crisis and after the uh, Iranian hostage situation, after 9/11, and after these news these days about the Muslim war, all these possible you know, questions being raised. Let's create more camps like we did during World War II. And, and uh, I simply tell people, okay, if you think about it, if you talk about it, remember Park Mountain, remember Tule Lake, and all these other places where our parents suffer so much, and say to yourself, never again to anyone. That's the whole point. And that's the way to try to keep avoiding people who regenerate these ideas for a person's death. The answer is short answer is we haven't learned. Right. Well, thank you. Don't forget to